Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 4, Episode 15. Believe it or not, we're more than halfway through. There's only 22 episodes in Season 4. We're going downhill right now to the end of Season (laughs) 4. A lot of things are going downhill. (laughs) (laughs) This episode is titled Indian Wars. It originally premiered on February 26, 1988. Now, here's what's going to get a little weird about who the writers were. And I'm going to let you come to your own conclusions on the quality of writing that happened for us. It was written by Frank Coffey and Carl Waldman. It was the only episode they ever wrote. But it was a group of people who wrote the teleplay, including Michael Duggan, who wrote Baby Blues, Lend Me an Ear, Viking Bikers, Big Thaw, Peter Lance, who wrote Rising Son of Death, Baseballs of Death, and Robert Palm, who wrote Like a Hurricane. So there was three teleplay writers. And this is the only episode that the two main writers wrote. It kind of feels like the teleplay writers took this away from them. Yeah, it kind of feels like they <laughs> changed it over. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Like, the crap, guys. We're stuck with this this week. Okay. Get all the vice veteran tele- uh, writers <laughs> together so we can try and fix this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There was something seriously wrong when the screenplay came down to the teleplay writers. Like, no, 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 no. No, we're not having We're not this. doing this. <laughs> Do you think they just read it and was like, there's way too much white devil stuff in here. Let's cross <laughs> this one out. Let's cross this one out. It is directed by Leoni Chasso. Now, hey, you guys know that name well. A little Miss Dangerous, Kill Shot, Better Living Through Chemistry, Rising Son of Death. Unfortunately for Leon, this is the last episode he will direct for Miami Vice. Some really good ones in there. Because he got fired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had some. He had some good episodes. They're like, look, you did Rising Son of Death. We're gonna give you another shot. And he goes, Indian War. So, like, look, you got to get out. Yeah, that's it. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, can check in, see what's on each other's lives, guys. I have one this week, and we like to talk about when a vice person is in a new movie. We like to mention that. And coming out this week is a little movie called Book Club. Now, let me read you the synopsis of Book Club. Four older women spend their lives attending a book club where they bond over typical suggested literature. One day, they end up reading Fifty Shades of Grey and are turned on by the content. Viewing it as a wake-up call, they decide to expand their lives and chase pleasures that have eluded them. Okay, I'm very curious as to who's in this. But... <laughs> it's starring Diane Keaton, Jane Fla, Candace Bergen, and Mary Steenbergen. Four older women who find a okay. new look at relationships in older life and after, and how sex. they're going to go after sex. Yep, sex. exactly. <laughs> and Melissa, I know how much you love the book Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I really hate that book. So there's that. I'm sorry if any, I offend anyone, but that's like one of the worst books I've ever read in my life. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I want my time back. I want my whatever, how many pages I read of that crap. <laughs> it's also starring the men who these women are chasing after or maybe married to. I don't know who all their relationships are, but Craig T. Nelson. Mm-hmm. Andy Garcia and Don Johnson. Oh, thank God! I was like, please tell me it's not <laughs> it's not Switek. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Tubbs, back in there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was Tubbs. Yeah, he is Jane Fonda's love Ooh. interest, who's eighty-five, by the way. Yeah, Jane I know. Fonda's right? eighty-five I years know, old. She looks great. Yeah, all of them Ooh. look great. I watched the trailer for this, and it was it, it, it's a terrible movie. Like, don't get me wrong, it's a terrible. You movie. You know, but Mary, whatever, what's her name? Steen Bergen. Ma- she's married to to, to, to Ted Danson. That's mm. Ted Danson's wife. Yeah, I knew I recognized her, and I recognized uh, the name. Obviously, Candace Bergen and Diane yeah, Keaton. Yeah. Uh, but DJ shows up in this movie. That's he, awesome. Mm-hmm. Now I want to watch it. <laughs> but do you think he does some... It's actually kind of interesting, <laughs> you know, Don. <laughs> I mean, okay, but isn't that kind of ironic because his daughter's in Fifty Shades of Grey and then he's in a movie where it's kind of like... <laughs> That's a, the point I was going to bring up. It's like, that'd be a little awkward that Dakota Johnson is in Fifty Shades. Yeah, it's a little awkward and then... And then you're doing a movie where they're like awake because they read Fifty Shades. <laughs> his his reply was that it was that he that it was fortunate for him that he's an actor and he understands that it's just it was just acting. It was just a job. Was that Good like for a- Don Johnson having a love interest his own age. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I think you can actually do better than Jane Fonda. Come on now. <laughs> I don't know. She specifically requested him. 
Oh, she really? She said she wanted Don Johnson she to be wanted, her love interest. She wanted to have sex with Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of uncomfortableness, we have this episode in Indian Wars, which I, is... I'm uncomfortable with the name right away. Yeah, and, you know, it plays like it's something that's going to be deeper than what it is. But, you know, though it ends up being an okay episode but when it's all said and done. But, yeah, but it makes me uncomfortable with the title, I got to say, right away. <laughs> Let's go talk about the awkwardness that was this episode of Miami Vice. Okay, so when we open up, Castillo's working undercover. Sonny's not welcome because the white man isn't welcome to work with these gangs that Castillo is trying to infiltrate. Acosta is a Colombian. He does not trust the white man. So Sonny is out of this episode. And Castillo looks amazing. <laughs> he needs to he needs to take I'm off the white shirt though. And tie though all the time now. <laughs> I was curious it- about why Dad was doing undercover work. Is this like a ninja mission? Is it ninja? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out on occasion the vice team might actually benefit from having a hispanic person on their team obviously gina but they have another hispanic and they had someone like jimmy jimmy johnny hey. what was his name hey. that they killed in the first episode hey, I can't remember. leave him alone he's a nobody too i mean they, they kept it they would be doing him a favor you, if they would have kept him around you trying to tell me jimmy Spitz is a nobody <laughs> I'll fight you. <laughs> I'll fight you for him. I mean, he wasn't good enough to stay on but, NYPD Blue. So. But he was in Star Wars. <laughs> who else? Who else? Uh, in Miami Vice was in Star Wars. Oh wait, nobody. Well, uh, getting back to the scene, I do like that Castillo is playing a uh, kind of playing a badass. Like these people are really scared of him. You know, he's talking to this guy like, "You better impress me," and and he has no backup with him. Like he's just rolling by himself. And that's the way it goes the whole episode. When Castillo, he's like, no, I'm going to go take care of this. He just shows up himself. No yeah. backup. Nothing. I kept wondering, like, don't you don't they think it's weird he doesn't have like a bodyguard? Because like that Acosta had a bodyguard with him everywhere. So shouldn't he? Ha- he should have had Swiatek as his bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> Is this like such a badass that these people are just that scared of him? Apparently, because even Levick is that way with him. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, that's why I like you. And please don't mess with me. I'm going to kill, kill my <laughs> my number one guy for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Basically. All he wants is his cocaine, too. He's all business. Like, where's my Coke? <laughs> yeah, I came here for Coke. And it's <laughs> yeah, he is super. Not only is he all business, but he's a shrewd businessman. I am going to be talking about uh, Castillo, <laughs> the businessman. So later, apparently, they're going to do this deal at a football stadium. Well, where else can you land your helicopter, really? As we found out in Miami, yeah. you can kind of land it at the, <laughs> one of the hundred different airport, abandoned airports all over the area. Also warehouses, too. Yeah, you know? yeah. I own the water. On yeah, the but local yeah. high school football fields, you know, that works too. <laughs> nothing nothing strange about, you know, a helicopter landing in a football field in the middle of the night. It looks like they're landing at the Orange Bowl. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> this meeting is set up at this gigantic stadium inside Castillo's in a sweet ass turtleneck. He like changed oh his clothes God, on his way neck. over to the to the meet here. He's turtleneck with Acosta. Look- that's a, that's a good look. The turtleneck. <laughs> around the stadium, armed armed men in camouflage are running around with like big automatic weapons, and they're running down towards the field. Right when the helicopter lands, and they go to do the coke exchange, that's when the bag man for the helicopter gets hit by this crossbow, and he goes down, and then the shoot starts. And you think that this is okay, going to be like okay, uh, okay, so. Do you guys remember the episode a few seasons ago in which we had the biker gang and the guy who was just in love with his crossbow? Like he was going to use it to kill someone. Who was also Native American, by the way. (laughs) So now we've got the cars back. It's back big time with with this guy's character. Uh, Why is a crossbow seen as such a badass weapon? I have have a feeling it has something to do with Michael Duggan, who also wrote Viking Bikers from Hell. He likes that thing. And so he, he likes wrote cross the hell play on this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he had one laying around. He was like, I got to use this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> I get to see him in the pitch meeting. So then the gunfight breaks out and he shows up with a crossbow. <laughs> okay, Duggan. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> save that one for later. Okay. Are you sure you don't want to use crossbows? <laughs> <laughs> they just run over yeah, you think like it's going to be like a rival gang they're going to kill everyone no they literally just take the helicopter and then fly away like there goes the coke i will say one that is a brilliant move to just jack the helicopter during a heist but 
I'm pretty sure the pilot never got out. So they just flew off with the helicopter pilot. No, they killed the pilot and they dumped his body out of it. Because I remember seeing that. And then the person they replaced oh. it with was, was, I was telling Dominic, the reason why I know is because the person they replaced it with was clearly a white guy <laughs> <laughs> who had camouflage on his face. <laughs> but I was like, that guy's white. <laughs> these people were supposed to be natives. That guy's white. <laughs> And then Castillo just looks at Acosta like, we got fucking robbed. Yeah. Exactly. And then we go to the opening credits. Who's backup? Castillo. Castillo tells it. Uh, where was Castillo's backup? No, he did. He said he, he said in the beginning that when I, he talked to Crockett, he's like, I'm not going to have any backup. And the Crockett said, like, you're not going to have any backup. Why don't you tell me where you're going to be? And he's like, no, I'm going to do it my this way. <laughs> Crockett. What he, what he, he said he's the one always harassing Crockett about not having backup. Maybe he thought Crockett was going to screw it up. <laughs> he's like, no. And, Look, you're filling in as the commander here or the lieutenant. Mm-hmm. Just don't mess anything up. You're on a need to know basis. Yeah, he said in there, like, <laughs> you're not going to have any backup. He's like, I know it'll be okay. I'll be fine. Like, whatever. He was fine. He didn't uh-huh. get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Now's our chance to check in with the guest stars. And this week, I think it's a little bit different than what we had last week. Last week, we had a whole bunch of guest stars that were mixed up in all kinds of different Hollywood things. What guest stars we got this week, John? So we only get one real guest star, as the other people were only in one or two other things, other if that, other than Vice. So we've got Joe Turkle, who plays Levesque. And his first film was 1948, City Across the River. And, and so from 48 to 98, he's been in actually a ton of stuff. But he is most notable known for playing Dr. Eldon Tyrell in a little thing called Blade Runner. Oh, (laughs) I didn't put it together. Now that you mention it, I'm like, oh yeah, that totally is. And he has something else, and you'll like this, Dominic. He is one of only two actors to ever appear in three different Stanley Kubrick films. Really? What what are the three that he was in? He was in Else the Glory, The Killing, and he played Lord the Bartender in The Shining. Oh, yeah, he is the bartender. He is the bartender. Damn, I didn't realize he was in two other Kubrick movies. He's in very either. early ones for Paths of Glory and, and the Killing. The killing. Like, wasn't like, the Killing like one of his first ones? It, yeah, it's like those are number two and number three. That was like 56. Like, or huh? three and four. It depends on how you count Spartacus. Wow. Yeah, the only other actor that was Philip Stone. So for you trivia buffs. A little side note, something cool. He actually joined uh, the army at 16. And in World War II, he was stationed as a Euro- with a, the European Theater Operations. And he's actually in some pretty big other movies as well, but I didn't feel like just listing all of them. Like the, the major things was the Blade Runner and the Kubrick films. So he also did some television, obviously, with Vice. So. I saw, I did a quick look at his page and I saw like he's in a lot of stuff. I mean, it's varying degrees on what his involvement is, but the list is huge. Yeah, I mean, there's like the credits just in just from like 1950 to 1960. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. He does a good job too, especially with the glasses that that they give him. <laughs> 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 when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. The whole team is working. No info on the helicopter. Some info on the one person from the gang. I don't know how to refer to them. They're like, I guess like a cartel or a gang or... No, I mean, we call them the Seminoles, uh. <laughs> the Gang of Tears. <laughs> I'm just going to refer to them as the gang. So one person from the gang was shot. He was a Mikosuke Indian and on the LRRP, which we never actually get an actual definition on what that He's is. a long range... Like they said it. They did? Okay, yeah. I, I must have missed that. Yeah, what did they say? A long range reconnaissance specialist. Mm. Crockett was trying to say that he's military trained and he could have shot him from far away and killed him if he wanted to. Is he, that our crossbowman? Maybe? Yeah, maybe. But he said like basically Castillo was lucky to get her alive because they could like they didn't want to kill him basically. That's why he's alive. <laughs> His name is John Lockdem. And Castillo says, yeah, of course, like they were all pros. Dad says, go check in on more if there's other LRPs in South Florida. And then also go talk to this, uh, this other sergeant in a different precinct who's also a Native American. Because I'm sure they all yeah. know each other. Not the right tribe yeah. or anything. But, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go talk to this guy? I think he's Indian. He says he's like 123rd Cherokee or something. He'll know. <laughs> and then the police commander comes in and wants to talk to Castillo. He wants some alone time with Dad. Pulls him into his office and he says, 
I just want you to be safe, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I want you everything safe. to be okay. I don't I... want to have to replace you. Uh, I think he's just more <laughs> worried that he left sure. her in charge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't be in the field. Someone's got to like, be here watching him. You're out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the most fearful thing that we hear in this whole thing is that Sonny's in charge of the whole vice team in the office. You know how good he is at showing up to things on time. Not, filing correct paperwork, answering not, the phone, not banging secretaries. <laughs> it's funny because you can tell he's in charge because a little bit later we get a scene where he turned Trudy into his secretary. Yeah. <laughs> we have a real fast scene at the gang hideout on the reservation where they're unloading the drugs and you hear some voices saying that it's good for the tribe and John Lockton gave his life for a good cause. And But then we jump really quickly over to the other precinct where Tubbs going to go talk to the other native, the lone Native American that works in the Miami-Dade police force, apparently. Also, they sent the black guy to go talk to the, lane, the lone Native American. <laughs> and then when that Tubbs shows up, you know, he's uh, the lone Native American cop writing a ticket for littering, one single tear growing down his cheek. <laughs> Tubbs asks him, like, hey, do you recognize this, this amulet that we found at the site? You're like, oh, yeah, it's definitely from that tribe, and they live out on the Big Cypress Reservation. And Tubbs asks, hey, so do you know if anyone's doing any drug running out there and stuff? He's like, I don't know. Do you know of any black people that are doing it? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah, because I know every Native American in all of Florida. Like, you know every black man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know I know all of them. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know for sure who that is. <laughs> uh, well, I learned about this scene. Apparently, this tribe does some alligator wrestling, and so I'm excited. <laughs> Sergeant says, why don't you go out to the Big Cypress Reservation and go talk to Chief Jumper. Instead of talking to me, how about you go talk to the actual tribe? They'll be able to give you some more information. I'm a Seminole. I don't know anything about that tribe. tribe. You should go talk to them. Yeah, but same thing, right? (laughs) When Tubbs shows up out at the Big Cypress Reservation, he's undercover as, get this, person studying and writing a thesis on the free world that wants to work with the tribe to learn their ways not with that sure he's not <laughs> he's got four buttons open what kind of scholar is that i don't know i like nerdy <laughs> those glasses though <laughs> i really like nerdy <laughs> i don't know he's not quite as good as nerdy crockett though nerdy crockett really pulls it off True. he's got the glasses and the pocket protector that one time where he's sitting by the pool getting hookers you know i'm disappointed i thought by season four we would be getting multiple identities I, we would be getting like nerdy jamaican tubs african <laughs> cowboy tubs Swedish yeah, tubs. Like, like i thought we would get more and more <laughs> into it you know and, and and we didn't even get an accent with nerdy tubs <laughs> i came in because I, I, I use the restroom i come back and i'm like is he jamaican he's like no <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> chief jumper says hey look lots of people come right here to try to write about us and no one will understand because you're not tribal but you should go talk to becky she's works with like our media she's like our pr person you, you should go talk to becky what we kind of learn about which is that she's the person to talk to because she's not only lived with the tribe, but she's lived out in the white devil's world, I guess. So like she has a better <laughs> understanding of both, which makes me wonder, do we have Native American spies wandering around us? Should I be on the lookout? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got spying on me, aren't you? <laughs> out at Lavex, Acosta and Castillo are talking to him. Castillo's really upset about the setbacks and the stolen coke. It's costing him a bunch of money. And everyone's shaking in their boots like, we made the wrong person mad. Now make sure we fix this real <laughs> fast. He he gets mad and everyone is very apologetic. And they really don't want Castillo you know, to have to murder them. At, <laughs> at the same time... These are some pretty chill drug dealers, you know. You'd think they would be angry about losing 10, you know, keys of coke in a helicopter. Like, that might incite some anger in them. But instead, they're more worried about whether or not Lone Ring is going to uh, (laughs) judo chop them. (laughs) Acosta wants to be sure that they're not going to be attacked again by the Native Americans. He, like, wants to go out there and just teach them a lesson. But Levick is like, violence is our last resort. Let's just make sure that Melendez still wants to sell the drugs here. 
and everything's gonna be cool. All right, it will be cool. <laughs> I, I love <laughs> basically chill out. I okay? love Castillo's attitude. You know, he's like, "Hey, man, you guys are on the clock. This is all billable hours right now." He starts <laughs> saying like, "He's such a shrewd businessman." He starts saying like, "Well." As of right now, we've only lost 20% of your share. I'm still good. <laughs> lost about 20% of your share. So. <laughs> Back at the precinct, Dad checks in with Tubbs. He mentions that Acosta says something about Indians. Gina and Switek think that the chief may know something about the drops and is stealing it to sell the drugs himself. And Tubbs is like, no way. That's highly unlikely the chief is involved in this at all. He calls Chief Jumper a quote unquote straight arrow. Back at the reservation, Becky is explaining to like a tour group on how they're not getting help from Washington, D.C. anymore. Only And half of the money that they raise comes from themselves. They're, you know, through through the casino bingo. and through bingo. Yeah. Through other things that, 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 that they're funding. And a man on the tour is like, you should be happy. You're guests in our country, essentially. That's so welcome when you're on the reservation, too. That you know. That oh yeah. Everything will be just fine. Oh, I was waiting for her to be, you know, like shut the f up. It was more like enjoy your cheap <laughs> cigarettes and booze. <laughs> Afterwards, Tubbs and Becky talk. She gives him a tour of like the behind the scenes oh, yeah, reservation, <laughs> and that's when they go see the alligator wrestling. And it turns out that alligators are just like me. If you lay me on my back, hold my mouth closed, and rub my belly, I just fall right to sleep. Because <laughs> they have small brains. They yeah, do. most stupid <laughs> mammals, if you rub their bellies, they'll fall asleep. <laughs> it's true for dogs, right? <laughs> While they're watching the alligator wrestling, Tubbs sees another man across the <laughs> ring, I guess. Like, who's that? And Becky says, oh, that's his chief's son. And then the two men across the way. I'm doing the same thing. Doing who's the that? same thing. Like, who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Out at Levesque's chief jumper is there to talk to Levesque. Levesque is really upset that he's been very generous with the tribe, made plenty of donations. He just wants to make drops on their property. Why can't he control his quote unquote braves? Yeah. <laughs> Get your stuff under control. Or I'm gonna have to come out there and take care Are of. Are we business. sure Levesque's not part Canadian? Because that was about the politest way of saying, "Hey, man, you ripped me off." <laughs> At the precinct, the team is discussing the case. Sunny has the addresses on all the L L R R P's in the area, and all of them happen to live on the reservation. Coincidence? Including a couple of them that can that can fly helicopters. So you know, like. All signs are kind of pointing to that the tribe is somehow involved in this. <laughs> you know, and like at the end of this meeting, Crockett, you go do this and you go do that. And I think he's getting a little carried away. You know, he's not the boss when the boss is actually here it, it, at the meeting. <laughs> Someone needs to rub his belly. <laughs> <laughs> at the reservation, the chief is talking to his son. His son like pulls up on a fan boat. He gets out. He goes up to his dad. His dad says, you need to stop killing these people. You idiot. <laughs> and the son says, you need to stop taking drug money to pay for stuff on the reservation. And then he gets back on his fan boat and leaves. It was such a waste of a fan boat ride. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, I think you were saying, like, I just stopped by to say I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, I don't like you. And everything you do, and now I'm gone. Here's my dramatic fan boat and exit and entrance. Because <laughs> you, how can you not be dramatic on a fan boat? Blows the the you fan boat, so, the fan boat scenes in this episode are my favorite because there's one that's a little bit later. Castillo and a bunch of goons are trying to look up, and they're bouncing around. And it just looks goofy as hell. <laughs> my favorite was the fan boat montage. That's what we're with, at right with, now. With, that's with right Crockett, now. I mean, Crockett with Tubbs with his arm yeah. around the guide. Oh no. It's Tubbs. Starts with, having with his arms out, he like, loves it. like like the Titanic lady. <laughs> you know, I could and I could just picture him <laughs> going wee. <laughs> but why do you think that that he that Tubbs the the person and the actor likes fan boats than rather than regular boats? Because you know when he's on the speedboat with because the Don Johnson's driving like the fan boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. True story. Which, by the way, it, Tubbs is, is really it, having the is, time of his life. Is it? Would it be creepy if, if the two of them made out in front of the airboat captain? Like, <laughs> just started making out while he's watching. Hey, Tubbs is having the time of his life. This is like the most amazing thing he's ever been on. <laughs> he has a fantastic time. And when he comes bounding off the fan boat and he runs into the chief's son, he's still like, that was great. You should get on one of these things. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> he comes up and he throws out the white man exploited us for our land and and now the black man's exploiting us for our pussy <laughs> and that's Tubbs is like hey man we're on the same page here i understand that i don't live on the reservation but he says quote you had custer we had the clan we have a lot more in common here than what you're giving me credit for but he's also saying like you're, you're not the only ones that have been mistreated and oppressed basically you don't have the corner you don't market market corner on that <laughs> shit's getting deep on miami vice uh-huh. but he also calls him a red man which i thought was quite <laughs> <laughs> the son says you can't handle life on the reservation tub says Try me. Turns out he really can't, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's a brief scene where Acosta is going to meet with Castillo to explain that, hey, we're, we're going to have this meet. He was supposed to give him 24 hour notice, but they're saying, we're going to go do it right now. Like, you need to go leave and go pick this up. Also, Acosta drives to the Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't talk about that. <laughs> uh, two things. One, have we actually figured out what dad's role in this operation is yet? Is he transportation? Is he protection i think he's dealer he's street dealer okay yeah he's supposed to be the dis- distributor okay. so he's supposed to distribute it when they get it like sell it so d- did this did this scene end with them getting back in the delorean and getting it up to 70 <laughs> acosta tells castillo that the meet is going to happen right outside the big cypress reservation and castillo castillo's like why would we do that he's like no actually it's not because that's I'm not a gonna terrible be there. idea <laughs> And Acosta says, okay, fine. What if I give you a better idea? Uh, not a better idea. What if I give you a better deal? He's like, yeah, okay, I'll be there. All right, fine. Yeah, because yeah, Dad's your still money. all business. I mean, right now, Dad's still in the black. These guys are the ones who are down to like 50% of their share. <laughs> so Castillo tries to call Tubbs, but Tubbs is too busy out having the time of his life his on one voice. of those fan boats. I don't know. That didn't look like that was a fun ride, that one. <laughs> all those guys, it was like sinking down. <laughs> <laughs> His voicemail must be full. It turns out Tubbs is going out on a boat with the son and like some of the cronies. They're going to go out. They're just going to oversee where this deal is going to happen, where Melendez or Castillo is going to go make this deal. He's finally going to get his coke. And as the fan boat comes pulling up, it just explodes. And no one gives a reaction. None of the gang that Tubbs is with. Tubbs is give a reaction. Castillo, no reaction. Except for one guy on Castillo's boat. He's like, oh, do you see that? <laughs> that was great. That was awesome. <laughs> what I didn't mention is that at the same time, Tubbs is also watching the gang dump all the cocaine into the Everglades. And they're telling him about, like, we're taking away this from the tribe. That way they're not making money off of this. And we're undercutting everything here. We're just going to dump it. We're not in the business of selling. We're not stealing it or anything. We're just going to dump it. See, I seem to think hooked up alligators is a really bad idea. So, <laughs> I mean, at, at first I thought there was like a 50% chance they were going to feed tubs to the alligators. But no, they're just getting them all cooked up and riled. Like, like, that's just dangerous. That's irresponsible. <laughs> it makes alligator wrestling so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Try to put one to sleep, rub it on his belly, and it's all coked up. <laughs> Had nothing but coke and whores all night. <laughs> Out at La Vex, Castillo shows up and tells Vec, like, I don't know why you're having me do business with Acosta. And Levesque's like, you're still going to do business with us, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got I'm going to continue to do business with you, but I'm not going to do business with Acosta. And Levesque's like, I got you covered. He turns on the light, and Levesque is swimming in, a fi- in his fish tank. Well, there you go. <laughs> Out at the precinct, Castillo calls Tubbs. He feels like Levesque is cutting the cost and getting rid of problems. Like he's desperate now. He really wants, really, really wants to make this deal happen. And he also thinks that maybe the chief will be next. That'll be the person, the next person he takes out because these deals keep going wrong. Tub says he'll have Becky go check in on the chief. Zwitek comes in and says that the DA doesn't have enough evidence to move on Levesque. I wonder if this is the same DA from... Yeah, it's that same vote of confidence. We, yeah. we can't prove he didn't climb into the tank himself. Yeah. <laughs> Out at the reservation, Becky goes over to see the chief and sees that he's gone. She runs over and tells Tubbs that he's been taken. Tubbs then goes over to the chief's son and says, we got to go rescue your dad. And the son says, this is what we get for using nonviolence. It's time for us to attack. And he goes and gets his crossbows <laughs> and all his automatic guns, and they get their camouflage on. And they're going to go take care of business. <laughs> and that's in the next the scene after this. But Tubbs like, I thought you guys were very traditional, like bows and arrows. And the son's like, Pfft. No, I'm, we're military trained. <laughs> Sucker, what do you think we've been doing all this time? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love 
I love that he thinks that they're going to go take on a cartel with bows and arrows. <laughs> Slingshots. <laughs> <laughs> they're like Ewoks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's trip him up. That, that always works. At the precinct, Castillo is telling the remaining vice team that Levesque's man was seen heading out to the reservation. No one has heard from Tubbs. Trudy comes in with info from the VA and says that the chief's son was injured in Grenada, like what Sonny mentioned earlier in the episode, but he was discharged on PTSD. He has like schizophrenia. He isn't doing this for the tribe. He's doing this for himself because he also see that He's having his disability checks mailed to a different address that isn't he, on the reservation. He's got a badass timeshare in Baton, and he's going to retire there if Tubbs just stay out of his business. <laughs> yeah, because Sonny tries to call Castillo and says that the chief's son's address is the most expensive place in Boca. It's a penthouse, yeah. And then Castillo tries to call Tubbs, but Becky answers. And Becky says, oh, yeah, they're on their way out to, to, to some guy named Love X. Okay, but who answers someone else's uh, phone? Especially <laughs> a car phone. A car phone. Like, well, that <laughs> damn car phone wouldn't stop ringing. Castillo's calling it. Tubbs is calling it. Whose car phone is that? <laughs> out at Levex, Tubbs is there with the gang, and he says he's going to go around back and get the chief out before the fireworks start. Question. Why do they bring Tubbs with them? I don't know, because he's a scholar. He's still he's, an academic. He's supposed to be an academic, not a not someone in the military, not someone they don't think he's they don't think he's a cop. So but why bring him uh, along? He could just be a liability. He's gonna rat all of you out. <laughs> yes. you know, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I just because he's not white, I guess. They're like, we could bring him. He's not he's not white. <laughs> it, yeah, that's true. They do they do make a point that they don't like anything white. White people, white powder, no white stuff. <laughs> the gang sneaks around, kills the worst guards in the history of the Coke gang. <laughs> They're all playing cards. <laughs> Levesque has his little six shooter and knows he's screwed. He just goes out on the balcony. He's he's looking like he's going to shoot, but you know, on his head, he's like, just kill me. Mm -hmm. He's just also go ahead and do blind it. as a bat. <laughs> like, he's right there, right in front of him, and he can't see him. It, it's crossbow time. Yeah. <laughs> A chief's son hits him with a crossbow. He falls into the pool, which our young daughter, who happened to walk into the room at the same time as that scene happened, goes, he's swimming. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, he's swimming. She's like, oh, no, he's falling. I'm like, oh, no, he's just swimming. And she kept saying, like, that guy was swimming. <laughs> Levesque is dead. Tub goes over and talks. Tub. Sorry, Tub. <laughs> Tub. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mean stub? Stubs. <laughs> there's hold on. There's there, there's tub, which is present tense. <laughs> then there's tubs, which is in the future, and then there's stubs, which <laughs> happened in the past. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs goes over and talks to the chief's son. Tubbs says, hey, that Coke that you dropped in the swamp, I checked that bag like when we were back at the reservation. It wasn't Coke. Hmm. So you're just out here eliminating competition. And now and we're out of confectioner's says, sugar. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> the chief's son says, hey, look, I'm only here to kill the white man, and then hops over the fence and runs off. Yeah, like... <laughs> Good thing for you. I only kill white men today. Here's my crossbows. And then Castillo, who back at the precincts when they run off to go take care of it, Sonny wanted to go run. And hey, was like, you're no, too I white. Stay out of this. White, Doesn't take the white devil. <laughs> Doesn't take Switek. He just goes by himself. He shows up at Levesque's house by himself, which is supposed to be with this guy, gorilla gang that kills people. And Tubbs just comes out and says, the son's crazy. And Castillo's like, yeah. yeah. And then that's the end of that yeah, scene. Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> like, they just meet up and they're like, Dang, man, that guy's crazy. Like, yep, you want to go inside and fix the sandwich? <laughs> just eggs, they just wander inside. So now we're at the last scene of the episode. The chief is talking to his son. He's tied up. He's disappointed in the son for leaving, but the chief still, he can't do anything. He's like, you know, worried that his son is going to do something crazy, but also telling him, you're a huge di disappointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does. He rings that a lot. He's a disappointment. The son's like, whatever. Yeah, he goes up, says, you've been a fool, and kisses him. Yeah, he doesn't care, man. He's got a S load of coke and beautiful place in Boca Raton, man. Like, he's set. And he does, like, he, <laughs> he makes that crucial mistake that most bad guys, most villains do. 
he sits and he like keeps like talking and trying to explain to his dad and it takes up so much time that Cubs comes bursting in and it has been able to find him. He's there with Castillo too. Again, no backup. They come busting in and the dad is saying, I know you're you're still stuck over there. No matter what I tell you, you're still stuck in Grenada. You still something happened to your brain while you were serving in the military. And they're They got the son at gunpoint. They go to untie the chief and Tubbs looks at the son and the son says, hey, it's better to die a hero than to live on your knees. And both Castillo and Tubbs go, no, (laughs) as the chief's son runs out the back door, steps onto the railing, jumps off the railing onto the ground below and has committed suicide. And that's the end of the episode. No justice for anyone here. He was saying, I have all the money. I can just go where I want and leave. And apparently you just get on Chalk's airline. You could take the drugs with you. Yeah, right. I mean, and, you can, yeah. yeah. So I think he was just going to leave the dad there to rot, though. Because I mean, who was going to find him? Yeah, I don't know. He was just going to disappear. Mm-hmm. Like that, I think that's what his plan was. Sorry, I thought that's what his plan was. And then he showed that he saw the Coke, too. Yeah, so I don't know. And I was yeah. like, so what is he going to do? Like, And he's saying, like, you're eliminating the competition. It's like, I thought he was a drug dealer. Why is he running away? I thought he was like a big dealer and he was getting rid of Levesque. So what's, I don't know. I don't know what the ultimate goal was other than maybe they were saying he's a, he's got severe PTSD and there's something wrong with his brain. He actually doesn't have a brain. Yeah. He's that, just kind of doing stuff. That's probably more likely that he didn't know what he was doing. That That's the only thing I could, because he went from, I'm going to be rich and the biggest drug dealer in South Beach to, oh, I guess I'm just going to jump off a balcony. You know, like that's a, that's a pretty big switch you know, in about 30 seconds. He also says he's just going to travel around as far as the money will take him. It's like, I don't understand. So was that his last hit? Like, Yeah, I think that's what he was trying to say. He was done. Maybe he was going to go sell that off and then that would use that money to travel around. He's going to sell it to the I guy know, named Melendez. Clear, but... or... <laughs> <laughs> or you like to call him Morales. <laughs> Morales, yeah. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> and that's this episode. I'm sure we have more final thoughts here because there was a lot of back and forth in this episode and actually a lot of police work. When you get dad involved, you get some real police work done. But before then, let's go talk about this week's music. Last week was big on music. This week, we actually have someone we've seen before. Maybe it'll be the last time they've been around. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. I did a quick look and I saw one band that I'm starting to know really well. Yeah, we get Hawaiian Chants by Yellow. You remember Yellow, the Swiss Electronica techno pop band made up of Dieter Meyer, who was a millionaire industrialist, and Boris Blank, and for a while, Carlos Brown, who I even talked about him, even though he left the band in 83. I've talked (laughs) about all of these people because they've appeared in the episode Kill Shot, Contempt of Court, The Rising Sun, and finally, this episode, which will be their last, thankfully. Ah, uh, I'm sad to see Yellow go. I'm just getting so used to seeing him every six or eight episodes or so. We will say adieu to Yellow. And the main thing I'm just going to talk about with Yellow, already kind of talked about how the band was to, to recap for the four music segments. Carlos Perón and Boris Blank founded the group in 1979. He then recruited Dieter Meyer, who is a millionaire and realist and gambler, professional gambler, to be their lead singer. And eventually Perone would leave, Dieter and Blank would continue to make music, and the biggest thing that they ever, ever, ever did was their 1985 hit, Oh Yeah, which was used in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Secrets of Success, American Pie presents the Book of Love, nine, like a bunch of other movies. It's the theme song for Duff Man and the Simpsons. <laughs> so used in very many Twix commercials in the nineties. You know, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was them. That's their claim to fame. So that and Miami Vice, apparently, they're all over the damn music. Now that we say goodbye, Peter and Boris, let's talk about. God's Gift, The Silencers. The Silencers were formed in 1986. They are, they were a Scottish New Wave band, and they were kind of like the... We've had a few of these bands featured before where they were like the Flogging Molly, Dropkick Murphys, where they used some of the Celtic instruments in more of like a New Wave punk kind of setup sound. The Silencers were comprised of Jimmy O'Neill, 
on vocals, Cha Burns on guitar, Martin Hanlon on drums, and Joseph Donnelly on bass. The band was founded by O'Neill and Burns, who were former members of the Scottish punk band Fingerprints from 1979 to 85. I think they had three albums or so. Their first single, Painted Moon, was a minor international hit, which was released on their first album, A Letter from St. Paul. And it included another minor hit called Icy Red. Their success kind of peaked by about album number three. By the time they put out Dance to the Holy Man, which would uh, bec- which would chart as a top 40 hit in the United Kingdom. And would probably be like the highest chopping, hurting album of theirs. They would actually lose two of the band members. Uh, Hanlon and Donnelly would leave the band, forcing them to be replaced to finish recording the album. And from there, it just kind of, every couple albums, someone would leave and they'd have to replace them. But Burns and O'Neill pretty much stayed throughout. Throughout the 90s, they, they were still somewhat critically acclaimed, but they struggled with distribution. So they really didn't get didn't chart or sell the amount of records probably they could have had they had better representation. So, and, and then as times changed and as band members changed, somewhere around the mid 90s, O'Neill's daughter, Aurora, would actually join the band and start performing vocals on albums too. They would continue recording until the early 2000s. Burns would die of lung cancer in 2007. And uh, the last mm. the last album they would release would be in 2008, at least as of right now. Mm. You're right. that We have had a few of these bands, too, where it's like this era of punk, maybe, I guess you might call it, where they take some classic instruments and then they put a new spin on it. And a lot of them from that Northern Europe area, too. Yeah, you know, and just like at the, this band, it very much reminded me of the bands like Flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphys. They don't dominate the charts, but they are consistently, they've been popular for over a decade. And this band was very much the same way. Like, they were popular through the 80s and 90s. They just weren't well distributed. They weren't mainstream popular. But they had that blend of, like, punk and folk music, like traditional Ir- Irish or Scottish, in this case, folk music. They're the kind of band where you would see signs for them, like, I have no idea who that is. And then you go walk by the, the club and uh, it's, like, sold out. And there's people out on the street like, oh, wow, there's someone big playing, uh-huh. I guess. <laughs> For the most part, their history is kind of vanilla because it's mostly just like they released this album and then this album. And it's kind of a short list because they really they peaked at the end of the 80s around their third album. And much of the music market shifted in the 90s toward grunge. And so they were they were kind of an outlier they, even though they still had someone following. What I did find interesting was that the other band names they considered, other than the Silencers, they considered my Annie's Green Chair and my favorite, <laughs> the Hot Dog from Hell. <laughs> are there hot dogs from heaven? Like, is there such a thing? Yeah. Not all hot dogs are from hell. It's a, let's ask oh, Mick no. Romney. He says hot dogs is his favorite meat. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course there are hot dogs in from heaven from 7-eleven <laughs> 7-eleven you can mail that check to p.o box 749 <laughs> i i will also be okay with it in hot dogs <laughs> all right well let's go give our final thoughts on this episode we had a really good one or one that we really loved last week We also had some stinkers earlier. I'm really interested to see where everyone lies on this episode. All right, Melissa, you're our vice historian. (laughs) You can give us the correct perspective on this episode. What is your thoughts on this episode? I like this episode a lot for various reasons, mostly selfish reasons. (laughs) (laughs) I really love Castillo being an actual (laughs) cop, like out there doing undercover work, wearing his various different outfit changes, (laughs) the black shirt with the white jacket, the black turtleneck, mostly for his outfits. No, I love him being an actual cop and you get to see that he that he could do the undercover he's not just like behind a desk and he's like some office stickler anymore and i also love the fact that 
Crockett is in over his head and he doesn't really know how to be a leader. <laughs> and he's like yelling for Trudy, like, give me my papers. Where are they? It's like, I'm coming. Um, also, I mean, who could who could hate a new persona for Tubbs? He's a scholar. <laughs> like I said, though, I don't know what kind of scholar wears his shirt that open. The Texan Jamaican scholar. <laughs> yeah, I know. The little glasses and everything. And he really enjoys himself on that speedboat, which is good to see him enjoy himself. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did a good job. I was worried. I'm always worried because it was a different time when Miami Vice came out. So some stuff could be considered racist. <laughs> that nowadays would be considered racist. So it was a little bit of tiptoeing around what could be. But I think it had a good message that, you know, for Native American tribes in general. It's definitely one of the better episodes of the season. Yeah, I would agree with almost all of that. Only thing I would add to it is that I saw that this coming how this episode was going to end because they never really developed Levesque as a bad guy. No. He's, he's just kind of there and you're like, oh, this is going to be about father-son stuff and the son and it's going to end in like one of those awkward scenes where they, he's going to try and commit suicide by cop or something. I'm like, oh. Well, that's, uh. that's they've done that before though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just always really like the episodes where the bad guys really developed like last week where like you really hate them or you like side you're on the, you're on their side or so, something like that. So this one, like the, none of the bad guys really that much developed, but it's, it's a small complaint. Like this is actually a pretty good episode. I liked it. I think they balanced it out pretty good. Uh, it's a, not a Sonny Crockett episode, which is nice. I mean, it sucks because it was only Castillo and Tubbs and it wasn't the rest of the team. But it's nice to get away from the Sonny storylines. And especially when it's Castillo, the police officer. Yes. The only thing we didn't get was Castillo, the ninja. Ninja police officer <laughs> together. John, what, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we've had so much heavy Crockett storylines that it it was nice to get Castillo and Tubbs centric episode. I got the feeling like Castillo needed to get out of the office because he didn't have to do the <laughs> undercover assignment. There are other non-white people who work on that staff. So it's just, I got the feeling like, like, Castillo just had to get out of the office for just feeling cooped up. I don't know. I still can't figure out what the hell his character was uh, or his undercover Sona was supposed to be doing or why they were so scared of him. Um, and it turned out his whole undercover assignment, completely useless. The entire c cartel, there's no one to have a case against anymore, except maybe the Native Americans that murdered them. Because, I mean, it take, there was more than just the ringleader there killing guards. So, but I guess that would be a, a little too much paperwork on their end. So we're not going to prosecute any <laughs> a, any other people from the, the reservation for murder. <laughs> I would take a brief little note from the cast to explain what Melendez's backstory is. Because that means that, like, Lavec and Acosta and stuff knew of him so that means he can use that melendez un undercover persona every once in a while that like there's this crazy distributor out there that you don't mess with yeah exactly yeah definitely and that'd actually be kind of cool if we saw him show up again but like in most vice fashion we're not gonna meet him again <laughs> but i mean it was it was a good episode through and through there was good police work and it seems like we keep saying like it seems like the better episodes are the ones where no one gets arrested if they're actually doing police work where they're actually arresting people then it's something goofy like like they're thwarting the bull semen trade you know <laughs> so but I, I enjoyed it it's nice to get away from crockett even though he was pretty upset about getting left out <laughs> and that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com check out that website go with the heat.com you can find all of the other ways to contact us youtube twitter facebook i think we even have a tumblr if that's still a thing you can contact us in all of those places we would love to hear from you let us know what your thoughts are on this episode this is back-to-back -back episodes in season four that we've really enjoyed that we thought were really good let us know what your thoughts are on this episode like I mentioned, that website, go with the heat.com. Be sure to go check that out. Go check out the ways that you can support us. Support number one, we would love to get from you. Contact us. We want to hear from you and other Vice fans out there. We want to talk to you. We want to see what your thoughts are on this episode. So please, if you're going to support us, please contact us. Number two way to support us, go to your podcast, your platform of choice. Give us five stars. 
Go ahead. It's not hurting anyone. Go ahead and just give us five stars. No one will even know I asked you to do it. Just give us five stars, but don't leave a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Go in there in the reviews if it makes you put in a review and write Melendez's backstory. <laughs> Tell us why Melendez is such an evil person and why everyone's afraid of him. That is going to do it for us this week. Be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's the last way that if you're looking for a way to support us, we enjoy a couple nickels. If you want to throw us some nickels, throw us some nickels. We'll take as little as a nickel. You got a nickel? Give us a nickel. I want your nickels. Go to patreon.com slash go with the heat. We're saving up for our own bull semen. <laughs> that is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all Bye, next time. Pal.